Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, the question is as follows. Is that basically, uh, could this have any application to the tribulation? And if it does have some sort of application to the tribulation, I mean, it gives a, he brought up a very good point over here where it's more like a question, obviously. Is it something where it has to do uh, watching for the soul? We have to, basically, does the minister have to give an account to God where it's basically they might have to watch for their souls or it might be the other way around? So let me first explain it this way, which might be helpful. If you look at the next verses, you'll notice that from verse 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22, it's the same type of closing that Paul would do with his other Pauline epistles. This is the reason why some Bible believers, I think I could be wrong, but most, most Bible believers believe that the book of Hebrews is actually written by Paul. And then some Bible believers would believe it's either uh, Apollos, ba Apollos, uh huh, and then some mention about Barnabas and then some other people, which uh, we don't know. But if you compare that closing from Hebrews 13 with his other last chapters in the Pauline epistles, it really, really seems to match together as Pauline style. Now, if you understand Pauline style, if you look at his closing, if you look at his closing, then uh, what is it actually? Uh, what is it addressing to? He's actually addressing to the people he's simply writing at. So, the church of Ephesus, if you recall, the last chapter uh, of his closing, he's addressing to people in the church of Ephesus, like, give my greeting to so-and-so, and he names the people. So, you'll notice over here that at verse... 23, he mentions a name, Timothy salutes them. See that? That's so similar with Pauline epistle. Verse 24, salute all them that have the rule over you and all the saints. They of what? Italy salute you. See that? So that's very similar with Pauline epistles. So if he's speaking to these churches, then it makes sense why a lot of Christians would take Hebrews 13, verse 17, and they can, they can apply that verse, Hebrews 13, 17, to the Christian church age. Why? Because Paul is talking about church matters, actually. I mean, he's speaking, uh, there, there's no doubt if you read the last chapter of Hebrews 13, he's discussing church matters over here. So verse 17, uh, according to context, can, you can use it, where Paul was discussing church matters and it can be applied to the Christian church. Now, could there be, the question now is, could there be a doctrinal application toward the tribulation? Absolutely, there can be a possibility. Is it 100% sure that Hebrews 13, 17 is for the tribulation? To be honest, I don't know, but you can say 100% that there is a possibility. You might say, why is that? The reason why that is possible is because of the, if you understand dispensationalism and biblical hermeneutics, one of the most important things that hyper-dispensationalists and even those who are weak dispensationalists or anti-dispensationalists, what is it that they don't understand on biblical hermeneutics? What is one thing they don't understand? A very important thing, which is a must, and that is called... Double application. Now, double application, how that works is that, let me give a, an example that could be very helpful. If you look at the ma major prophets, right? It talks about end time prophecies for the children of Israel. It mentions about, for example, Babylon will conquer uh, the nation of Israel ruin their homes and their houses, the children will be like slaves or they will be slaves and etc. 
And we can see that as an application toward the Old Testament Jews that time. However, if you keep reading that chapter about Babylon imprisoning or enslaving Israel, and it talks about Babylon's destruction, it goes from an Old Testament time period, and it seems to transition all of a sudden toward an end time application about Babylon being destroyed. That's how the double application works. Why? Because the key thing is people do not understand an important thing which is called prophecy. Prophecy is absolutely important, especially in the book of Revelation. You saw that, right? Prophecy, when God is giving a prophecy about the future, He's putting multiple time periods within a prophecy. That is very important. When a prophet gives one prophetic sermon, it puts in all sorts of time periods over there when God talks about the future. Why? Because prophecy is simple. All it's talking about is the future. And in the future, God's not going to say, this is what's going to happen in the year A.D. 56 and then 1997 and then uh, 2007. He doesn't make it clean off like that. He don't divide it into portions. In a prophetic statement, it's, it's just a simple statement about the future. That's all that it is. It's as simple as that, all about the future. You have to go into that future and divide it to an Old Testament time period where God was prophesying about the future of Babylon's destruction, or you're going to have to divide it to a future time period where God divided it toward a tribulation. Okay, so that's important. So Hebrews, when you read... Hebrews chapter 13, that's how it could be applied for the tribulation timeline. Now, uh, if it can be applied to the tribulation timeline, uh, what could it apply to? Where it has to do with watching for the soul, uh, could it relate to that? Well, how we can tell is this. If you look at Hebrews 13, 17, how we can ex understand the interpretation of that verse toward a church age application, because this is double, right? Now, I'm not going to get through that. The general epistles, it's important to understand that it is double application to church age as well as tribulation. But I'm not going to explain it here. I'm just going to take it for granted that you guys know this so I don't waste time on explaining. Taking it for granted, it's this double application approach then why is it that we can understand the interpretation to this one easily, right? Yes. We can understand it easily, but not this one. What's the problem here? This answer is simple. Because we understand our church age doctrine really well. Yes. So because we understand our church age doctrine really well, we can easily see how Hebrews 13, 17 can be interpreted for us. That's the key with tribulation. If you understand tribulation doctrine very well, then you can find out which pieces in Hebrews 13, 17 can be interpreted. All right? Now, let's try to do that with tribulation doctrine, all right? So, we do know that this is talking about ministerial leaders, right? Hebrews 13, 17. They uh, submit yourselves to them that have the rule over you because they watch for your souls. If we understand tribulation doctrine really well, will they have these type of spiritual leaders that they're going to have to follow and look up to? Absolutely, because God raises up uh, Moses and uh, Elijah, the two witnesses. Not only that, there are 144,000 the Lord put the, His mark on, where they're going to have to spread the gospel, and that, that's the gospel concerning tribulation doctrine, gospel of the kingdom. And, and that can be found at Matthew chapter 24. So if I'm a tribulation saint... Reading Hebrews 13, 17, that makes sense to me. They watch for my soul. Yeah, that can make a lot of sense. Why? Because they have to keep tabs on me. Did you comply with the Antichrist system yet? Did you have the mark of the beast? Think about that one for a bit. Or not only that, salvation in Revelation chapter 12 is not just faith. It's faith and what? Work. So they definitely have to watch for their souls. Hey, how's your spiritual walk, you know? 
There's no greater motivation on an altar call than telling one of the members that your soul is at stake here and you're going to burn in hell. So why not <laughs> repent and get right with God? The altar call will be filled every single time at a tribulation <laughs> church service, right? So that's the idea, uh, idea over here. Now let's keep reading. Um, that they may, uh, as they that must give account. Ah, so to, uh, they have to give account to the Lord. Is that true? Yes, there is a judgment for tribulation saints. We read that in Revelation chapter 11 and Revelation chapter 20. Also that they may do it with joy and not with, gr uh, and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Yes, that is unprofitable for them. It doesn't benefit them that the leaders, especially they're depending on these leaders during a really bad time period, that you don't want that minister to be weak. You want him to be happy to minister and help you out. Right. All right, so that's the explanation for that one. 